flat as a friggin' maggot. Of course. One of the more unsatisfying sounds, I think you'd agree, and I've got places to go. So, let's get gone in 60 seconds without calling the cavalry. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australia new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Now, dead as a dead dingo's donger, battery-wise. Which is an occupational hazard, I guess, if you're a motoring journalist, because you're always evaluating someone else's car and your own car sits here, undercover, doing nothing for several weeks. And then you need to go out and Murphy's Law, whatever. So you need a rescue and it is undignified to call for help. So what's the easiest way to do that? Hey, mate, the easiest way is going to be award-winning investigative journalist Cletus Van Dam. Yes. <laughs> Wake the lazy prick up. Let's do that. Cletus Van Dam in three, two. <sighs> That's bullshit, mate. There is no spoon. One. <laughs> so good to be out again. I hate that other guy though. He's an okay talker, but such a pussy when it comes to doing anything practical. Let's do this. Okay, so this is an Oscharge Rescue Mate 1000. Looks like a battery pack, but it's actually full of capacitors. I did a full review on this some months ago, and I've been waiting for a flat battery like this just to show it in action without it being contrived. This is authentically the rescue situation that we've all had those nightmares about on the way to a job interview or that first date, whatever it is, okay? Getting the kid to wherever or picking the kid up, even worse, right? So anyway, sorry about the noise. The bloke up the back, a couple of doors down, has suddenly got a fetish for water blasting everything. Or maybe he's just building a dirty bomb, who knows? Anyway, what you do with this thing is it's full of capacitors, so you don't have to charge it up and you don't have to worry about whether it's gone flat for the past three months when you haven't needed any sort of recharge and your battery's been working just fine. So it doesn't need to be charged up and what you can do is use the residual energy that's still in the notionally flat battery because I just checked, you know, the battery here is okay to adjust the electric seats and do all of that kind of stuff. It'll work the headlights and it'll drag the Bendix mechanism across to try and engage the starter. It just doesn't have enough grunt to do the cranking and get the engine up and running. So you just expose the positive terminal, right? Red goes with red. Even, even a politician could get this right, or a senior executive in a media company, right? Black goes with black. You get some green lights up there that basically say, yeah, okay, I'm doing my thing. And then there's a, a countdown that comes up. You can see the numbers are trickling up as we speak. There you go, you get the message that says ready to use. So the theory then is really simple. You hit run, you got 10 seconds to get into place. It'll count you down when you get a beep. You just start the car like usual. Let's give that a nudge. There we go, we're getting the countdown. Let's get ready. So look, if you haven't played Symphony in Battery Flat before, one of the critical things to remember is that when you get the damn car started, do what I'm doing now and leave it running because if you turn it off, you'll be back to hooking this thing up again. Speaking of which, this is the gruntiest one they make. It's an Oscharge Rescue Mate 1000. They make a 500 amp one as well, which is just fine for most cars. 400 bucks for this one. That's the manufacturer's recommended price. 300 bucks for the 500. Now, 
If you know someone with a crappy car with Christmas just around the corner, 300 bucks is not a bad present for them because they never have to plug it in. You don't have to worry about is it charged up or anything like that. Just shove it in the boot, use the residual energy in the battery to get you going again in minutes and you can rescue other people with it as well so that's kind of nice if you've got you know a functioning moral compass ozcharge.com.au for more details there you can check them out online i'm just a fan of the product too they sent me this for review and they let me keep it but no money changed hands and as you can see it just works i've been waiting for a situation just like this to demonstrate its functionality to you and guess what passed with flying colors Back to you, fat man. Cletus Van Dam there. He's all about the tools and the chicks. Now look, we're going to finish this show with a thought-provoking nut in just a sec. But first, Cletus, right? So popular with you. Cletus's father, the late Professor Jethro Van Dam, held a PhD in dead languages at Walton Mountain University, Sanskrit and Latin. It's pretty clever. There wasn't much the late Professor Jethro couldn't wrap his tongue around, that's for sure. He named Cletus after the Latin Cletorus, meaning that which is elusive. Most people don't know that. Cletus is very popular with you, of course, and I understand that, but at times it makes me feel like a, a hologram down there. Bring back Cletus. This sentiment is, of course, echoed by Biggles1024, who says, Thumbs up this comment if you want to see Cletus Van Dam make an appearance before Christmas 2018. Winky face. Cleaner sings the Eagles. We need this album. To be perfectly clear on this, I've got a peaceful, easy feeling about that too. You know, he's a hard-headed man, but brutally handsome and nasty reputation as a cruel dude. So yeah, I can see how that would work. The songs would virtually sing themselves. Is Cletus on holiday? or in jail. Cletus embodies the proof that any of us can triumph from adversity. He was homeschooled in the barnyard with a custom syllabus designed by his somewhat eccentric parents. He earned four PhDs in animal husbandry. By the age of 12, sheep, goats, hamsters, and <coughs> our fine feathered friend who came out rather a lot. Cletus is simply not like you and me. To Cletus, jail is a holiday. And now, thermodynamic nutbaggery writ large. Yes. I wonder whether my WRX would benefit from a larger intercooler. Turbochargers add considerable heat. I often drive in mountainous regions. Although I have not made measured temperature comparisons, I suspect there is a lot of heat under the bonnet that would not be there were it not for the turbo. I am concerned that certain sensitive vehicle components might not have been designed to withstand those temperatures over 250,000 kilometers. Since I want my vehicle to last as long as possible, it occurred to me that a larger intercooler could help. If you are willing to provide it, I would like your opinion regarding the usefulness of a somewhat larger and or more efficient intercooler in extending the life of my vehicle's engine bay components. Not all nuts are malignant, clearly. This is a benign, nutty inquiry that's just sadly not informed by even a vestigial grasp on the facts, at least in my view. And that's why it's so wrong. It's breathtakingly presumptuous to assume that you can have no education on heat transfer and stuff like that, and no data 
and yet still possess the confidence to dream up a purportedly better system than the one a bunch of engineers worked on and validated by testing. I guess it might be liberating not to know what you don't know, but ultimately it's not gonna help. An intercooler rejects heat from the inlet air and bleeds it by convection into the engine bay where airflow from forward movement dissipates it. Therefore, a bigger intercooler rejects more heat into the engine bay and therefore the engine bay will get slightly hotter, all other things being equal. And also, the density of the inlet air will increase because it's now cooler, and this will allow the engine to burn even more fuel during periods of high demand, climbing those mountains, overtaking a truck, whatever. The result is gonna be more power, and that means more waste heat. So the engine will get hotter, not cooler. This is like thermodynamics in the beer garden. A bigger intercooler will not cool down the engine bay. It will heat it up if you drive your WRX like you stole it. And let's face it, that's why you bought one. Also, I'd want to know that the injectors can keep up. In other words, the MAF sensor is going to notice the extra mass of air going in, right? It's essentially then going to tell the engine to deliver more fuel. So at 6,000 RPM with your right foot flat to the boards, I would really want to know that the injectors and the fuel pump can deliver sufficient fuel because if the engine leans out under those conditions, internal temperatures will skyrocket and the cooling system will not keep up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly how you melt pistons. So I'd want some expert WRX tuner involved at some level if I was gonna dick with this stuff Otherwise, you might engineer in the exact opposite of durability. But there's also another massive logical problem here, and I don't know if you've seen it yet. There's no evidence that temperatures in the engine bay are, over time, contributing to failure of components prematurely. This is a completely fictional proposition. Dozens of engineers did actual R&D with prototypes in extreme environments with thermocouples pasted all over the engine bay, taking actual temperature measurements near critical components and comparing those measurements to the operating temperature limits of those parts. And if it's too hot, they either move the bits or if they can't move them, they protect them, for example, with a heat shield. You know, when you see a shiny aluminium heat shield down there, it's generally not because someone had a dream that this would be a good idea. It's data driven. Now they don't always get it right, I admit, because cars are complex and complexity is the enemy of reliability and not all failure modes can be predicted in advance. But you have to give those R&D dudes due credit. You've got fuel, plastic, electricity, heat, and massive airflow, the unholy, the unholy quinternity of conflagration, all within a bee's dick of each other for 250,000 kilometres, and yet cars don't all catch fire routinely, except Fords. Not only that, they're generally quite durable, except Volkswagens and Jeeps and Mercedes-Benzes and Nissans and Fords and, of course, Holdens. So I'd suggest that these kinds of modification dreams are aimed at non-problems and operating in the domain of decisions stemming from dubious reasoning and a complete lack of evidence. Can you not just watch porn like the rest of us? Modifications make sense if you say, I want to do blah, where blah is something your car currently cannot do, such as, I don't know, 12 second quarter miles or three emergency stops back to back from 160 kilometers an hour or something. But these other kinds of nutbag fantasy modifications are in fact not the way we got 12 men to the moon and back, plus of course, the crew of Apollo 13. You know, this is a common and uniquely male mental illness. <laughs>